My thoughts and it's hard to breathe I've been feeling all alone but they'll never see yeah, I've been slowly breaking So why won't you come save me Try to fix my soul without Try to find a way somehow Picking up the pieces now I know I'll only ever need you, only ever try to find something to chase Waited for my heart to change, now I can never be the same Cause I'll only ever need you, only ever Clinging to the past never set me free I trust your love when it's hard to see
Hey, good morning, everybody. So, so you know this, soon and very soon, Rowan is going to take over our announcements, okay? Uh, we didn't talk about it again this morning, so I got you covered uh, for, for, for this morning. Uh, number one, as soon as we finish in here today, we are going to appreciate all of our Sunday school teachers over in the annex with a big fellowship. It's going to be great. Everyone's invited. Come on over. Let's have some lunch and and uh, hug your Sunday school teacher's neck. Uh, my goodness, they, they they work hard and they love you and uh, and, and they love Jesus. So uh, yeah, talk, uh, hug your Sunday school teacher's neck and let's appreciate them uh, today. Second of all, tonight is a special called business meeting at 6 p.m. Members only meeting and uh, once again. Uh, 18 and over for tonight. Uh, subject matters will be 18 and over. So uh, y'all, y'all come tonight. Uh, this is a big one. We're talking about the parsonage, as you know, and 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 a few other issues. So you'll want to be there uh, tonight. On the 19th, ladies' ministry, uh, ladies' uh, Bible study is going to happen from seven to nine over in the annex. That will be awesome. On April the 20th, that is a Saturday, right, Rowan? Men's Ministry, 10 a.m., right here. Uh, come show up. We're going to have a great time. Uh, men, what we want to do is learn how to be men, godly men. Amen? That was weak. That was weak, men. Uh, if you don't come on Saturday morning, the 20th, at 10 a.m. to the men's meeting, uh, I, I hope you're at work. I hope you're not in bed or out hanging out doing nothing uh, because it's, it's going to be awesome. And God is calling us as men in this church to rise up and to be counted and to be what he has called us to be. So men, 10 a.m., Saturday morning on the 20th. 21st is a Sunday. We have our leadership meeting. And uh, then you can read all the other stuff uh, that's coming up. But uh, uh, I encourage you to come back tonight, 6 p.m. Uh, pretty important, pretty big. So you need to be here for, for this. Uh, uh, like, again, talking about the parsonage thing. And, and you need to be here for all of that. All right. Um, I have no further announcements. Does anybody know of any? Then we will zip it. And we will begin worship right after we pray. Father God, you are welcome in this place. Father, I pray that you would land all over us today. Not only through the preaching of your word and, and us hearing your word and, and you helping us to be doers of your word as we leave. But God, in, in our music, even in our announcements, we want to honor you with everything that we say and everything that we do. Father, you are amazing. And we thank you for filling us with your spirit. And I pray, Father, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth this morning as we just absorb as much of you as we possibly can. And all this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get on our feet. Uh, God made us to thrive. Amen.
us like Jesus does. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who tells the sun to rise every morning colors the shades of his glory wakes us with mercy and love Jesus does who holds the orphan and comforts the widow cries for injustice feels every sorrow carries the pain of his children Jesus does so we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son praise to the Spirit who's living in us while I am a sinner you save me Washes us clean with his blood, amen. Jesus does. Who sings a song of sweet forgiveness? Who stole the keys to hell and the grave? Who has the power to save? Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living. Jesus does. 
Y'all don't wait on me. Walk, go ahead and pray. Much 
So, good morning again. I'm extremely happy to see everybody here this morning. It's no secret, you and I have been ran through the ringer since last Wednesday. We, we got that. It's been gut-wrenching, and we're at a soul-searching place in our own personal walks with God. Amen? That's where we're at. I've been tempted to preach on mercy on grace, on justice, on unity, uh, all kinds of different topics of importance for us as a church. And every time I started to work on a sermon, God kept pointing me back to one thing, to one scripture. So this morning, I want to share with you some very fresh and raw thoughts that we all need to consider whether you're a member of our church or just hanging out with us today, I'm, I'm super glad that you're here. And, and this is for everyone, every person. Um, 
I would like for you to open your Bible. I know this is quick. We don't normally do it this quick. I usually have some really cool things to say and a fun introduction and a joke or whatever. No, open your Bible to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. So, um, in chapter 2 and 3, Jesus is speaking, okay? And, and it's, it's what J Jesus told John to write to the churches, the seven churches at this time. And we get to this church in Revelation 3, 14, called the church at Laodicea. Now, I want you to understand that this church was, was, was situated there in Laodicea, and several miles away was its water source. And the water was pumped in uh, or flowed downhill into the, the town of Laodicea. It came from a hot spring. But by the time it got down to Laodicea, it was lukewarm water. It wasn't hot. It wasn't cold. It was lukewarm water that came in. Now, I want you to read this with me. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write... Now, that means the angel is, is the pastor of the church at Laodicea. That's what that means. So, so Jesus is telling John, I want you to write this to the pastor, to the elders, to those that are basically running the church at Laodicea. The words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation... I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Jesus says, I'd I, I rather that you would be cold or hot, one or the other. Now, cold water is useful, isn't it? Very useful. Man, when you get through mowing the yard and you come in the house and you get you a tall glass of ice water. That's really good, isn't it? It's refreshing. Makes you feel better. Hot water is really good. When you need to wash your, your clothes and, and, and wash your dishes and all that kind of stuff, you, you want hot water. You want it clean. You want it sanitized. You want the, the, the hot water. It's very useful. But lukewarm water, if you drink lukewarm water, Lukewarm water can make you sick. If you're overheated and drink it, you'll, you'll get sick. If you're uh, uh, hypothermic and drink lukewarm water, you're going to get kind of sick. It's going to make you sick to your stomach. In other words, hot and cold are useful, but lukewarm is not useful. And, and I'm paraphrasing. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I know your works. You are not useful for the kingdom of God. You're not useful. A church. He's writing to an entire church. Now, the church isn't the building. It's not a town. It's not any. The church is you and me. The ecclesia is the word church. The called out ones. We are called out of this world and into his marvelous light. And Jesus said, I know your deeds. You're not useful to the kingdom. In fact, if you're not useful to the kingdom, then what are you to the kingdom? So because you are lukewarm, verse 16, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, that is very, very nice language for what it actually means. Jesus said, I'm going to vomit. I'm going to puke. I'm going to up chunk. Okay? And, and, and this is serious. Lukewarmness makes Jesus sick to his stomach. And this is a church that he's writing to. And they make Jesus sick to his stomach. 
For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Man, that's the American church. We say we're rich. And you know what? If you can find a nickel in your couch, you're richer than most people on earth. If you got a quarter laying down in the floorboard of your car, you're richer than most of the people on earth. That's crazy, isn't it? But it's true. It is true. That's America. That's Texas. That's Venus. That's Venus Bible Church. Come on now. You say I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Jesus talking here. And white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. In Laodicea, they were famous for, for this eye salve that they made. It was a miracle eye salve. If, if you have an eye problem, man, it'll clear up that eye infection. You'll be able to see then. And, and he's talking to them on their level so they understand He's talking to you and me on our level so that we understand. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father God, this morning as we look at your word and we, and, and we uh, consider what you have just said to us in your word. Father, I pray that you would help us to see ourselves. Help us to see our, our sin and our shame. Show us where we are in error to you and your word and help us to repent and confess and leave here in a right relationship with you, God. Work in our hearts and help us to understand. If there's anybody here that hasn't trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord, as always, I pray that today would be that day. Help us to understand the truth of our depravity and the truth of your amazing grace. And all this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, folks, so, so I, I want to tell you, I preached on the seven churches of Revelation when I got here. And, and this is not the same message. It is a different message. This is a message that God has been placing in my heart and in my soul and showing me how I am poor, pitiful, wretched, and blind. We just are. I believe that our Western brand of Christianity makes Jesus sick. And now if, if, if you think that's right, or if you say an amen, I, I want you to understand that I am talking about you and me. Okay? I'm talking about Venus Bible Church in Venus, Texas in 2024. This is us. This is us. We make Jesus sick to the point that he wants to spit us out of his mouth. He, he wants to puke because of us. I don't want to be that guy. You don't either, do you? 
I mean, yay God, right? We're on team God. That's what we want to be. Yet, and so did the church at Laodicea, that they wanted to be on team God as well. They're just like everyone else in, in this world. The truth is, is that what passes for the Christian lifestyle in our culture is actually sinful. In Johnson and Ellis County, if we went and knocked on every door, I'm, I'm pulling from Paul Washer here. If we went and knocked on every door and said, hey, I want to know if you died today, would you go to heaven? Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Everybody's going to say they're a Christian. There's a few, yeah, but most everyone's going to say, you bet, I am a Christian. Rub it up, dub, yay, Jesus. That's what they're going to do. They're going to say that. They're going to believe that. Where are they? How do they live? What passes for Christianity in our counties in our city and even in our homes is making Jesus sick to his stomach. Please know this. I want to give you a few examples, okay? Being so busy that we don't have time for God is normal. That's normal. It's normal. God understands. We live in a fast-paced society and we have to keep up. God gets that. He knows that. He understands he understands that your kid's baseball is more important than him. That's what he understands. He understands that, that your work is more important than he is. That's what he understands. You bet he understands, but he doesn't understand what we think he understands. He understands the truth. We twist it. Being so busy chasing after the American dream and success that God gets our leftovers is normal. God gets it. He understands. It's okay because I love Jesus in my heart. I love him in my heart. I don't pray much. Don't really even attend church much. But I love Jesus in my heart, so he understands. Not spending time in God's word, not spending time in prayer is normal. And yes, I'm talking about you. I know how much time I spend in prayer and how much time I spend in God's word. It's not near enough. And we're kind of on the same, in the same boat, aren't we? It's normal. It's normal. It's okay. God gets that. <laughs> what he gets is that we don't love him like we're supposed to. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we stink at both of them. Let's be honest, right? We stink at both of them. Adultery is normal. 65% of husbands and 55% of wives cheat on their spouse by the age of 40. True story. Some of you in here have been cheated on, and you know it. You want to know who we really cheat on? We cheat on God. We commit spiritual adultery. We cheat on God. Adultery is normal. Spending more money than we make is normal. Keeping up with the Jones is normal. I'm so glad the Jones don't go to church here right now. <laughs> We'd all have to try to keep up with them, wouldn't we? I mean, how else are people going to know that we're better than they are? Right? I mean, come on. I, I have told you nothing that is not true up to this point, have I? Sex before marriage is normal. Safe sex is normal. Teenagers, that's a lie straight from hell. Do not engage. Amen. When you start dating, you need to take your Bible with you on, on a date, and you need to put your Bible between you and your date. Boy or girl, makes me no difference. You put your Bible between them, between y'all. Pray before you leave. Yeah, I'm telling you, pray before you leave. 
And then that boy's got to climb over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John just to get to you. It's funny, but I, I'm, I'm being honest up here, okay? Lying is normal. Everybody does it. If you tell me I don't lie, you're a liar. We all tell lies. Drinking in excess is normal. Drugs are normal. Cheating other people out of, out, 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 in, in business or however, it's normal. It's just business. That's how it works. And we say it's normal. Following the crowd is normal. Standard every day, that's what we do. All of these things and, and many others are, are just part of normal everyday life for most people in America, even the church. I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth. People that don't act like what I just described, they're not normal. They're out of place. Something's wrong with them according to, to, to our world. Something's wrong with them. And all of these things I mentioned are normal even in the Christian community. And it's making Jesus sick to his stomach. Satan is doing a really, really, really good job. And the truth of the matter is we're cooperating with him. We are. Again, you know, we say, amen, that's right, preacher, you're right, uh-huh. Again, I'm talking about you and me. Huh. This is us. So basically what we've done is we have decided that Jesus didn't really mean the things that he said. That's what we've decided. That somehow God is going to excuse our apathy our lack of obedience, and our blatant sin, all in the name of normal. So we can be normal and fit in with the rest of the world. Yet, you open the Word of God, and 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. Behold, the new has come. And if we were a new creation, then we would be different. The old is gone and the new has come. How can we call ourselves different when we still live and act like the rest of the world? How can we do that? Have you ever seen a caterpillar? They're ugly little creatures. That they are green and yellow and weird looking and crawling around on 197 legs and uh yeah that's an uneven number it's he, he lost one or something i don't know i don't know how many legs a caterpillar has but but you got this ugly caterpillar and this ugly caterpillar is eating the leaves off the trees and doing his thing just hanging out being a caterpillar and one day he starts spinning a cocoon and he wraps himself in this cocoon and a metamorphosis happens. That's what the scientists call it. I don't know. I guess that's what it is. Metamorphosis, is that right? So a metamorphosis happens inside this cocoon. Something crazy happens inside that cocoon. And all of a sudden, this caterpillar busts out of this cocoon. And it's got these wings and it's just a beautiful butterfly. Folks, when Jesus Christ gets a hold of your heart, like that ugly caterpillar, a metamorphosis happens. You are changed. You are different. You are a new creation. And you are a beautiful butterfly meant to bring him glory on this earth. That's what happens. Like that butterfly, as soon as we trust Jesus, we are different. We change. How many of y'all have ever read stuff from Francis Chan? 
I like some of his writings. I don't like some of them, but I like some of them. He's got a book called Crazy Love. If you've never read it, it's a good one to read. He has a chapter called The Profile of the Lukewarm. And I'm going to read some excerpts from this Profile of the Lukewarm. Listen and see if any of this describes you. I know it does. I know you. You know me. It describes us, right? Listen. Lukewarm people attend church fairly regularly. It's what's expected of them. What they believe good Christians do, so they go. Right? Lukewarm people give money to charity and to the church as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. If they have a little extra, then it's easy and safe to give. They do so. After all, God loves a cheerful giver, right? Some of you are saying, dang, he's already hitting me. Lukewarm people tend to choose what is popular over what is right when they are in conflict. They desire to fit in both at church and outside the church. They care more about what people think of their actions, like church attendance and giving, than what God thinks of their hearts and lives. Lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. They don't genuinely hate sin and aren't truly sorry for it. They're merely sorry because God is going to punish them. Lukewarm people don't really believe that this new life Jesus offers is better than the old sinful life. Lukewarm people are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they do not act. They assume such action is for extreme Christians, not average ones. Lukewarm people call radical what Jesus expected of his followers. Lukewarm people rarely share their faith with their neighbors, co-workers, or friends. They do not want to be rejected, nor do they want to make people uncomfortable by talking about private issues like religion. Lukewarm people gauge their morality or goodness by comparing themselves to the secular world. They feel satisfied that while they aren't as hardcore for Jesus as so-and-so, they are nowhere near as horrible as the guy down the street. Lukewarm people say they love Jesus, and he is indeed a part of their lives, but only a part they give him a section of their time, their money, and their thoughts, but he isn't allowed to control their lives. Lukewarm people love God, but they do not uh, love him with all their heart, soul, and strength. They would be quick to assure you that they try to love God that much, but that sort of total devotion isn't really possible for the average person. It's only for pastors and missionaries and radicals. I got a bunch more in here. Lukewarm people think about life on earth much more than eternity in heaven. Daily life is mostly focused on today's to-do list, this week's schedule, and next month's vacation. Rarely, if ever, do they intently consider the life to come. Lukewarm people are thankful for their luxuries and comforts and rarely consider trying to give as much as possible to the poor. Lukewarm people do whatever is necessary to keep themselves from feeling guilty. This goes on and on and on and on and on. I left that on and off. Sadly, this describes us. This is us. In Matthew 15, 7 through 9, Jesus said, you hypocrites. You know who he was talking to? 
the religious leaders in the synagogue. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teachings as, t- teaching as doctrines the commands of men. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me. Let that sink in. Has your relationship with God actually changed the way you live, act, and think? Has it? Somehow, some way, we have falsely come to believe that we can control God. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. I don't think that. Yeah, God's here to grant my wishes. To make my life easier and better. Somehow life is about us. Life's about me. In my little bubble. Life is about our comfort and the spoiling of our children. I mean, did God really mean it when he said in Luke 9, 23? And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Did he really mean that? Because when I read that in my Bible this week, at the end of it, it didn't say JK. That's text talk for just kidding for for you older folks. I am hip. He, he, He didn't just say that. It doesn't say to let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me as long as you're okay with it. It doesn't say as long as you don't have something more important to do. He meant it. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I want to take you to the movies for a minute. Are you ready to go to the movies? Okay. This movie, you have a role in the movie I'm fixing to take you to. You have a part to play. This is cool. You've always wanted to be a movie star. Look at you. You're killing it. Right? Let's go to the movies. The movie begins with a blank screen. If you look back at that one, it's blank. It begins with a blank screen, and there is nothing on it. And God said, let there be light. And light came screaming out of the mouth of God at the speed of light. Boom! And there's light. And now we we move on, and God's arranging the galaxies. All of the galaxies, even those we don't know about. He's arranging them exactly how he wants them because he's God and he can do that. And he arranges all of that and and then he makes the Milky Way. That's our galaxy that we live in, the Milky Way. He makes the Milky Way and he hangs all the planets where he wants them, all the moons exactly where he wants them. And the stars are all hung in the sky exactly where he wants all of them. Now we have a whole solar system. And everything is revolving around the sun. The S-U-N. But the truth is, everything we see and don't see revolves around the S-O-N. The Son of God. Do you see yourself in this movie? Of course not. You're not even born yet. You're not even where close. God says, hey, Jesus, I'm paraphrasing. Let's make man in our own image. So he forms Adam out of the dust of the ground, and he sees that it's not good for man to be alone, and he takes a rib from Adam's side, and he makes Eve Adam's wife. And you're still not here. 
He tells Adam and Eve to multiply and, and, and populate the earth. And in comes Cain and Abel. And then later Seth comes on the scene. And finally, years and years pass by and Noah gets here. And there's no one righteous that can be found on earth. So God's going to flood the earth. But Noah was a righteous man in the eyes of God. So Noah is saved. He and his family are saved from the destruction of the flood. The generations continue. And no, you're still not there yet. Hold on, your part's coming up, okay? It's a long movie. Finally, Father Abraham is born. He marries Sarah, the love of his life. And God says, Abraham, I want you to go to a place that I'm going to show you. God wants to build a nation. And he makes a covenant with Abraham. And then in comes Ishmael, because they hadn't had any children, so they take matters into their own hands and mess it all up. And he's not the child of promise. But later comes Isaac. And Isaac has Jacob, and he has Esau. And years pass and Joseph is born. And then Moses comes into our movie. The Hebrew children are in Egypt and they're slaves to Pharaoh. And Moses grows up and God says, Hey, Moses, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. Moses says, I, 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 I can't. And God said, You are. And he did. We fast forward just a little bit and now Israel is a nation just like he promised Abraham. It's a cool movie. Israel is now a great nation. And look, there's Mary and there's Joseph. And Mary's a virgin and she's pregnant. What? Yes. She's pregnant with the Son of God, Jesus. A miracle happens. Jesus is born. He grows up and at the age of 12, he is astounding the religious leaders with his knowledge of God at the synagogue. By the way, Joseph and Mary lost him. He stayed back at the synagogue while they were all headed back home. Anybody seen Jesus? And they run back and there he is just astounding those leaders. Now Jesus grows up to a man. He's traveling all over from town to town, preaching and teaching and healing people and making the blind to see and the lame to walk. He's eating with tax collectors and sinners. He's casting out demons. He's doing all of his miracles. He's already changed the water into wine. He's doing all of these things, and he's saying, Folks, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And now it's Friday. And there's Jesus hanging on the cross. He's not dead yet. He's dying for our sin. You're not in the movie yet, but Jesus is thinking about you. Sunday comes. And God raises him from the dead, assuring the salvation of everyone that will believe. And now, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God in heaven on his throne. Stay with me. There's a huge point to this, and your part's coming up. God is in control. From start to finish, all the way up to this moment, God is in control. And now we go through the dark ages and the black plague. Wars happen, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. New empires are built and nations are formed all at the will of God. We get to the 1500s and the printing press is invented. And Bibles are mass produced. And they're now in the hands of regular people just like you and just like me. Martin Luther over in Germany. And Ulrich Zwingli over in Switzerland. 
They're, they're leading what we have come to know as the Protestant Reformation. Praise God. Amen. Right? Yeah. Fast forward to 1776. The Declaration of Independence is signed and America is formed and God is still in control. Revival breaks out in the 1700s and it's called the Great Awakening and people are being saved and, and, and missions begin to start happening. His word is being spread all over the place. And then in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there's another great awakening. And millions of people are, are saved. They believe that Jesus is the only way. That He is the truth, the life, and the way. And that no one comes to the Father except through Him. And, and they trust Jesus as their Savior and make Him the Lord of their life. And there's even an argument for another great awakening that's in between these two. It's amazing. Praise God, He's in control he always has been, and He always will be. The 1900s happening. Your part's coming up. We've got wars and rumors of wars. Are you ready for your part? Are you ready? Here we go. Here's your part. And now it is the year 2500. And you're long gone. And God is still in control. There's a real big point to that. You are not the main character in this movie called Life. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are the main characters in this whole thing that we call life. All of life is totally about them. Him. James chapter 4 verse 14 says, What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, then vanishes. Church, you're here for such a short time. It feels like forever, doesn't it? But you're here for that long, and you're gone. In the movie of life, you are here in one tiny frame, and you're gone. So this is my point. You and me. We don't have time to be lukewarm. Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? In the grand scheme of things, life is absolutely not about us. It is all about bringing glory to God. That one little frame that you're in, that one little blip... It's all about bringing glory to God. That is the reason that you have that tiny, little, bitty, obscure part in this thing called life. That's the reason for your ent entire existence. That's why you're breathing right now. To bring glory to God. How are you doing with that? Does that sum up your life? I'm bringing glory to God. Does that sum up your life as you're living it up to right now? Church, we are lukewarm and honestly we make Jesus sick. But there is a cure. There is a cure. If you are not yet a Christian, Jesus says if you believe and confess, you will be saved. You can do that this morning. And from that moment forward for the rest of your life, you can try your best to make everything that you say and do bring glory to God. 
many, most in here say, well, I'm already saved. I've already believed. I've already confessed that Jesus is Lord. Second Chronicles 7, 14 and 15. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Church, I'm tired of being normal. I'm tired of us looking normal. I'm tired of living my life every day normal. I want to be different. I want to look like I belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that He is my boss, He is my King, He is my Savior, He has my allegiance, and nothing else. How about you? How about you? It isn't about us. It's all about Him. And you have a choice to make this morning. And God is such a gentleman, He lets you make the choice. It's up to you. Will you live for Him, or will you continue to be normal? That's the only two choices. Father God, as we uh, bring our service here to a close, Lord, I I, I want you to uh, search our hearts, God. Get alone with us. And help us to decide here and now. Are we going to be normal? Or are we going to live the rest of our lives to bring glory to the King of kings and Lord of lords? Father, it's everyone's individual business to do business with you right now. Work in our hearts and help us to respond to you this morning. Because either we love you or we don't. Either we bring glory to you or we don't. God, help us to break out of normal and to love you with everything we have. In Jesus' name, amen. We're about to stand and we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And and the invitation is this. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, there is no better moment than right now to come and trust him. And if you've been living your life as as normal, you can come and the altar's open. You can confess and you can repent and you can leave here in a right relationship with God, serving Him and bringing glory to Him. It's your choice. But whatever you do, get alone with God during this time. And if He wants you to just come forward and pray, you come forward and pray. If he wants you to come forward and trust him, trust Jesus as Savior and Lord, you come and do that. I'll be right here. If you want me to pray with you, I'll pray with you. If you want someone else to pray with you, grab them and bring them up and pray with them. Whatever you do, get alone with God and respond to him. As we stand and as we sing. What does God want you to do in response to his word?
everyone to hear me sing.
Father God, as we leave this place, I pray, Father, that we would leave here singing how great thou art. God, you are amazing. You are wonderful, merciful, counselor, mighty God. And we thank you for who you are. And I pray, Father, that we would be better kingdom people. Father, we do ask your blessing on our fellowship meal as we honor our teachers and thank them for the work that they put into teaching us every single Sunday, week in and week out. Thank you for their dedication. Thank you for their love for you and their love for us. Guide us now as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. One more announcement before you go. If you are a teacher, leave the building and make your way over to be first in line for our fellowship. Like now, scram, go. If you're a teacher, you go on. And we will all follow you. Uh, you are our guest of honor. We love you and we thank you. Seriously, teachers, hurry up. We're hungry. Guys, thank y'all. We'll see you over at the Annex.